Folks, it's my pleasure to now welcome to the Avon, Karen Allen. Let's give her a big round of applause. Welcome. Hi. Thank you again for joining us here. Oh, it's such a pleasure. It's and I have here. to say, it was a much different experience for me watching the film again on the big screen. It just feels completely different. Yes, um, yeah. It looked beautiful, so yeah. thank you. Th my my yeah. pleasure. Yeah, I, I think the, cine you know, the cinematographer's work really, really shines, and the performances really shine on a large screen. I mean, it's, it's a film that really, I think, is a little lost, you know, if you watch it on a computer screen or, or something. It really needs, it needs that kind of size. Undoubtedly. So tell us what brought you to this career point where you decided not only would you be directing, but that you wanted to direct uh, a film. Well, I had a kind of resistance to directing a film. Um, I'd been directing in the theater for about the last 10 years, and one of the producers who I had directed a play at his theater in New York at the Cherry Lane Theater um, kept sort of bugging me about, why don't you do a film, why don't you do a film? And at one point we were sitting down and I said, well, you know, <laughs> I've worked in films for too many years to ever uh, fool myself into how uncomplicated it is, how many people are involved and the time and the commitment it takes to make even a short film like this. And he said, well, if you were going to make a film, <laughs> what, what would you make a film of? And I said, I think the only thing that really comes to mind that I feel like I could really get excited about doing is this Carson McCullers story, A Tree, A Rock, A Cloud, which I read when I was maybe 19 or 20 years old, and I was very much a fan of her work. I think, like many people, I started with The Heart is a Lonely Hunter and was so engaged by her writing and her sensibility that I then read really all of her novels. She has a rather small body of work because she died at such a young age and through a lot of her life was debilitated by illness from an an illness she had had as a child that had gone untreated and left her with a lot of physical difficulties. Um, so at, at one point when I finished reading all the novels, I, I began reading all her short stories, which are quite, if you haven't read them, they're quite diverse and extraordinary. Um, but this one leaped off the page at me and it just stayed with me over the years. and. I always somehow thought, even from a very young age, I'm going to do something with this story. I had thought I might put it on stage as a one-act play with another one-act play. Um, and, you know, then I, I brought this up and, and um, this, this friend and producer that I knew read the story and he said, I want to help you do this. Let's make a film out of this, and I sort of thought, okay, I'm going to stick my toe in this water and see how it goes. I was struck while watching it, and I did go back and read the story afterwards, that she was approximately 24 or 25 years old when she wrote this, Yes, and that she was writing it from the male point of view, at yeah. least in the use of the protagonist in the story, and then beyond that, and maybe you can speak to this part, a tree, a rock, a cloud, the title and the deeper meaning and significance of the story beyond what's at the face of it, a story of experience versus innocence and loss and love. Could you speak a little bit to the title itself and, and what it connotes to you within the broader story? Well, I think one of the things that drew me to the story is um, I began to read um, you know, kind of to be a student of Buddhism in my late teens and early 20s. And I 
felt when I read the story, it kind of encapsulated one of the most beautiful aspects about Buddhism in, in the specifics of, you know, looking at the nature of love as being something that exists inside of us, as opposed to, I think, a lot of us grow up in this culture thinking somehow that love is outside of us and that it's something to be attained and gotten and won and worked for. And I think the beauty of what he's saying in the story is that he approached love in that way until he went into a kind of suffering when he lost love because you know it's it's actually hard to hold on to it when you either take it for granted or grasp it or hold it and um you know his his wisdom was really to come to this place of realizing that you know it it, it already exists inside of us and it's really you know, I, I love the, the beauty of starting with something as simple as loving a tree, which is a living organism, loving a rock, which is kind of a, uh, was living once possibly, but is, is, is kind of now a solid object, and loving something as ephemeral as a cloud. And that being a kind of uh, opening to the experience of the possibility of loving something as complex as a human being. Now, for her to have written this story when she was 24 or 25 years old kind of blows my mind. Um, the story goes, and I only know this story because we took this film to Rome, not this summer, but the summer before, in a celebration of Carson McCullough's 100th birthday. Um, the foremost expert on Carson McCullough's work is a man named Carlos Duas, who teaches at, um, oh, oh, God, the name of the university has gone right out of my head. Um, <laughs> anyway, he teaches at a university in Rome, and we took the film there to show the film, and um, he took me aside at one point and he said, I want to tell you the story of this story, how it came into being. And he said it's only talked about in her letters, which have never been published. And he said at the age of 24, 25, after The Heart is a Lonely Hunter had been published, and she had become, she was launched into the world at 21, 22 years old as an extraordinary young writer. and. A year or two later, she had her first stroke. Um, and she went back to Columbus, Georgia, which is where she had grown up, to her mother's house to try to recover from this stroke. And she hadn't been able to write for months. And she was in this sort of very low ebb of her life and trying to recover and was just sleeping and not able to do much or, and she woke up one morning feeling somehow revived. She went to her typewriter, she sat down, and this story just wrote itself. And when she was done and she put the last period on the last sentence, she started to weep and she wept uncontrollably for like, I don't know how long, but that was the birth of this story. And, you know, he said this was in her, her letters describing to somebody how this story came to be. That's an incredible ex story yeah. about the story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a very particular approach to the filmmaking that you've taken on with this movie. Uh, and I was hoping you could perhaps speak to some of those aesthetic choices uh, in terms of both the use of black and white and the still photo photography that, mm -hmm. that the camera is just, it's just there. 
Yeah. It's, it's not an active participant, if you will, the way filmmaking can often be in this day and age. Can you speak to that a little bit and how yeah. it lends itself to the story? Well, around the time that we were just first starting about doing this film, we were talking about, um, I was talking with the cinematographer about the style of the film, how we wanted to shoot the film. And I had seen maybe six months before this extraordinary Polish film called Ida, or Ida as we might say, um, by Paweł Palakowski. It won that year, um, his cinematographer won best cinematography, and the director won best foreign film. It was an extraordinary film. I don't know how many of you might have seen it, but it hearkened back to me. It was shot with such, such simplicity, with a very still camera, just observing his actors and telling the story. And I, I felt so moved by it, and I, I realized how much I was longing for storytelling like that in film, which I think goes back to a lot of the films I was in love with in the late 60s, early 70s, kind of through the 70s, and how these days the camera is constantly moving and shifting and you never really get to be with the characters in a sense. Like the films, films these days have a tendency not to really breathe. You know, they're, you're, they're fr frantically trying to entertain you in some way or keep you engaged, but very rarely do they really ask you to be there with them. And this film had such an impact on me in that way that I thought I'd love to start there. I'd love to start with that simplicity. It's a simple story. There's really only three speaking roles in the film. We're mostly in one location, all of which was very appealing for somebody making a, a first film to just keep it simple and, um, you know, to try and find a real way to let the story reveal itself instead of trying to force feed anything. So, I, I looked at Ida maybe um, eight times, um, and the cinematographer also looked at the film, and we didn't really, we're not imitating anything in the film, but we're just using a kind of simplicity of telling a story that we thought would actually serve this story really well. And the black and white just came out of us you know, with a little film like this, you, you don't have a lot of resources, so you have to use every resource. You know, for us to find the four um, 40s vehicles that we use in the film was like a major, major deal. Um, to find every, to, to have the little tiny bit of production budget we had to take this old abandoned building and turn it into what would be believably um, a restaurant kind of bar of that period took every bit of resources that we had and we, we felt shooting it in black and white would give it a kind of place to sit in time a and that we would, you know, that, that it would allow for a kind of um, reality but also there is something about black and white that really allows you to, it's sort of everything that isn't important when you shoot in black and white sort of falls away. And everything that is important comes to the foreground. And particularly the way that um, Rick Sands lit this film really allowing the faces to sort of kind of shine in the film. I think we felt that black and white would really serve the film. 
I think you most certainly accomplished that. Um, I don't know if it was by design or not, but I kept thinking of just Norman Rockwell paintings as, a, as I was watching the movie. It, uh -huh. it evoked that notion of sort of mid-century Americana and, yeah. and that era of just simplicity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to me, at least, while watching it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Carson's a little darker than Norman yes. Rockwell. Yes. <laughs> but, but yeah, she's the sort of dark side of Norman Rockwell. Yeah. Why don't we take it out to the audience and sure. give them an opportunity to ask some questions. And we're going to go around with mics on either side. So if you could raise your hand, uh, we'll come to you and uh, wait for the mic. And I see a hand up there. And we're going to start all the way in the back. Um, baseball managers and football managers have styles where they alternately uh, threaten and cajole and hug and pat and disdain and swat and movie directors and I guess theater are kind of the same. Uh, they say John Ford was very difficult and Clint Eastwood doesn't even like to say action because he thinks it's jarring. <laughs> so uh, what styles have you experienced and how did they shape what you have done? Oh, that's a great question. And in fact, uh, we Adam and I were that. talking about this just earlier. Um, I've, I've had the opportunity, both in the theater and in film, to work with some just extraordinary directors. Um, but a handful of them have had a great impact on me in terms of me uh, trying to define, in a sense, what kind of director I would like to be. And I think when I first started, um, I don't know how many of you know Simon's Rock, Bard College at Simon's Rock, but over the years I've, I've taught there in the theater department. Um, I think I've taught maybe eight semesters on and off. Um, so, you know, you, you little by little, find that you develop a style or a way of working with actors. And I think the person I have most aspired to and who inspired me the most is Arthur Penn, who Adam and I, uh, uh, we actually met um, when Adam came to, I live in the Berkshires, and we have a film festival in Great, Daring, Great Barrington called the Berkshire International Film Festival. And Adam came the second year of the festival as we were celebrating um, Arthur Penn's career. But I go way back with him because I worked with him in the theater for a number of years. Um, and he had a way of working with actors and directing, which was quite illuminating to me. Um, I'd never really encountered a director like that. And I found that, you know, under his sort of gaze as a, as a director, I really felt that I could do anything. I mean, I felt completely freed and inspired, and um, and it really had to do, I was telling Adam earlier, with just the pure quality of his attention. Um, I think when someone gives you their full and unqualified attention, you rise to something in yourself that you don't even know exists. And I've tried to emulate that in my work with actors, to be a, a kind of non-judgmental presence that allows them to explore and find their way into the shoes of the character that they're playing. and. Um, I think that really he, you know, he was a, a fine example of everything I would ever hope to be as a director. I saw another hand somewhere in the front, and we're going to yeah. come over with the mic. Th 
Thank you very much. I, I just have to say, I agree with you completely. It's very, very uncommon to find simplicity and patience in film, and it matched the message so beautifully. So I really enjoyed that. Oh, thank you so much. Um, two questions, really. One, has this really gotten the juices flowing for you to pursue other projects like this? And the second is, are you seeing film now as a director as a way to voice your own kind of personal worldview or messages you want to get out there to the public? Um, it, it has definitely whetted my appetite to do another film. You know, to direct a film is a, is a huge commitment, much different than that of an actor. I mean, as actors, we generally show up, you know, a week. We might have done a lot of preparation and research and work on our own, but we show up, we shoot the film, we're, we do the play, but generally it's a three or four, five, six month commitment. A film, even a small one like this, this was really three years of my life. Not that I didn't do some other things, things here and there while we were in the process. But it's, you know, I, we spent a year taking this all over the world um, to film festivals because once it's made for a short film, that's really, it's life is in film festivals. There's not a lot of commercial venues or, or you know, it's, it's a film festival world for a short film. And uh, we, we wanted to kind of share it. So any festival that asked us to come, we, we, we went. And um, I do have another, there's another film that's based on a play that I directed about 10 years ago that I would very much like to make as a film. And we're now kind of you know, the playwright and I are now kind of moving forward. It takes a long time, particularly, you know, if you're gonna do something slightly offbeat, something that's not, you know, obviously mainstream, um, to get things done. So you, you have to really, you know, plant your feet on the ground, and really know that you're in it for the, for the long run. So as we move forward for this, I think both she and I realize it could take us years to raise the money to do it, much less to set it up and to go into the pre-production and then get it shot and then do all the post-production and then deal with the distribution and, and all, you know, all those aspects of it. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that we'll um, get, this, get this film made. Um, we have some, some interest in, in, in it. Um, but it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, a major commitment of, of time and you, you go through a lot of ups and downs. Um, this little film, it took us a year and a half to raise the money to make it. We thought it would take us like a few months. <laughs> but no, but no. Uh, we're gonna go to this gentleman all the way here in the front and then we're gonna come to this gentleman over here. And we have a third question in the middle that we see as well. Hi, we, we actually met a few years ago at one of the sh uh, uh, Chiller Theater. That you uh, uh. Yeah, I have one of the golden idols from the, from the Raiders. <laughs> anyway, the reason I was going to ask you, my great uncle was Henry Hull, the character actor, mm -hmm. and I know he did both stage, film, even radio and TV. Uh, he always told me that what he loved most was the stage because of the immediate reaction to the audience. What do you love most doing, stage or film? You know, I, I really love them both. I think, you know, it is true that the stage is more of an actor's medium. You know, once you start doing the play, the director is usually 
gone after the play opens, and it really becomes about the actors working in concert together to really deepen and develop the material and the characters. And there's no one around to say cut <laughs> or action. You know, you really take ownership of what you're, what you're doing. Um, it's a little more difficult to do that in film um, because it is such a collaboration. And I have certainly worked on films where I really believe the film I saw in my head and the character I thought I was playing once the film was put together by someone, I, I didn't even recognize. Uh, you know, they had a different film in their head and I thought I was playing a different character <laughs> than I was playing. All the moments that I thought were defining the character, you know, occasionally they're not even on the screen. Um, so, you know, it's a, hum it's a humbling thing for an actor to be in a film. Um, you have the glorious opportunity of having a second and third and fourth or fifth or sixth take so you can try a scene a lot of different ways and that's always interesting and fun. But on the other hand, you get, you know, when that scene is finished shooting, that's it. You don't ever return to that moment and uh, one of the frustrating things that actors in film often experience is, you know, two weeks later, you know, as you've gotten to know the character better, you think back on those early scenes and you're like slamming your forehead and thinking, I didn't really understand that scene when we were doing it. I, you would like to go back and, and do it again, which is what we have the opportunity to do on stage. You're growing every night and it's it's almost like sculpting you know you're 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 constantly in the process of creating and recreating in film particularly once the film is finished it's there it is that's all there is there's no you know redos um, so i i think they both have their beauty you know they both have beautiful things about them um, you know plays come to an end, and the only people that see them are the people that happen to come to the theater over that three-month period of time. Films, you know, for better or for worse, <laughs> live forever. <laughs> you, know, you, can, you know, so, and you know, it's interesting. I mean, there are films I've worked on that, you know, when I saw them, I was really quite disappointed, and then I'll see it again 10 years later, and I think, oh, that's not really so bad. You know? <laughs> So somehow they, they have a life of their own. They do sort of change, at least in my own, in my own mind. But um, yeah, I don't have, I don't, I really, I just, I love working and I love an opportunity to, they're both very challenging in their own ways. Yes, right over here. Hi. Hi. Um, it's, it's been mentioned, but so many of the elements of the film, um, the lighting and the fact that it was in black and white and uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the sort of static camera work really allowed me to listen carefully to what was being said. And I noticed how much of the film consisted of shots of the other character listening, the reaction shots. Um, so the whole thing has a feel to me that is very, it feels of that time. Mm -hmm. And the message is a timeless message. And I felt myself wondering, obviously you were being faithful to the original story, which I assume is set in that time. But do you think that that message, that story could be told in a more contemporary time and what would that film look and feel like if you had to make that film set in the modern day? Oh, that's interesting. I have a friend who's a filmmaker who was discouraging me from setting it in the time that she wrote it. He, he wanted me to set it now. And I did, I did think about it, but 
I love the story so much as she wrote it. And I think having read it so many times, I really had images of it already in my mind as set in that world and of that time. If I were going to do it today, you know, the man might be a homeless man, you know, on a, on a street in Newark, New Jersey, or, you know, down, you know, on the Lower East Side, and the boy might be a kid from the neighborhood where somehow they managed to, I don't think you could set this story, I mean, I don't know if places like this exist where you can have bacon and eggs and, and, and a beer at the same time. <laughs> I mean, I think this is of a, it, you know, the story she wrote is of another world. It's, it's a world without cell phones or computers. It's a world where, you know, a boy, she has him, he's delivering papers. Nobody delivers papers anymore, do they? Maybe they do, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Not on a bicycle, probably, <laughs> but maybe throw them out of the back of a car. But um, I think I love the world she created too much to really let it go, and, and I don't think I was that. But I do think it's a timeless story, and I think I get so moved every time when he says, do you realize what... Um, I mean, I'm going to forget the line right now, but do you realize what this could, could mean? And, you know, we live in such a divided world these days, and he's talking about, you know, developing techniques that are not about division, but about acceptance and love. And I, I think, you know, it's, it's such a story for our time, even if it's set in the 40s, the, the basic thrust of what he's saying is something that um, really speaks to me in terms of, you know, can, can we learn to love each other, please? You know, can we stop, like, being so divided and, and f you know, all this the madness that's going on in the world? And he's just, he's talking about learning tolerance learning um, generosity of spirit, learning to open his heart. Um, so I, I think it has a very important message in there, you know. We're gonna uh, go right over here, yeah. We're gonna, uh, microphone, yeah. Uh, I was absolutely fascinated by the characters and the acting yeah. that they did. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about those two uh, stars of the, of the production. Yeah. I thought the little boy was outstanding. And that, that little boy is incredible. Um, he's never acted before. And he actually is the son of an old friend of mine I had met him when he was maybe a year old and hadn't seen him since. And then it turned out, I wasn't even sure he and his mother still lived near me. It turned out that he was also the nephew. Do you guys know who Doug Trumbull is? Yep. Yeah. It turns out he's the nephew of Douglas Trumbull, who is kind of the George Lucas of the East Coast. He's an extraordinary uh, innovator in the film world, and he has a film studio in the, in the Berkshires, and he's very innovative in the world of, of uh, all kinds of technical aspects of shooting films. He's invented cameras and all kinds of optical uh, uh, he worked, he goes back to 2001, A Space Odyssey. Um, he's done all kinds of extraordinary work in film, both as a, a really special effects person and as a director as well. Anyway, Jackson is his nephew, 
And when we were first talking about doing the film, we had a sort of, at my house, I invited, I don't know, maybe 40 or 50 people to come, and we did a little presentation. And his, uh, uh, Doug Trumbull's wife came up to me afterward, and she said, oh, I know exactly who would be wonderful to play this boy, my nephew. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, OK. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. And um, she then told me who her nephew was, and I realized it, it was the son of this f friend of mine. We went ahead and put out a casting call for uh, kids, and 350 kids and their moms responded. <laughs> and um, we narrowed it down to about 60 who we met with, and at one point, this, it just came back into my head that we should meet with Jackson. And he wasn't available during the casting call. He's a, he's a real baseball player. He's like the hero of his school's baseball team. He's a pitcher, and um, he was off doing baseball. But I, m I met him and spent about a half an hour talking to him, and I thought, oh, I think this kid is special. We met 60 kids, we did screen tests with 12 of them, and I just didn't feel any of them were the kid that I had in my head. And so I had Jackson come back when he returned, and we did a little screen test with him, and we knew instantly that he was the one. And it really just had to do with what I would call the quality of his attention. Like a lot of the other kids, they were acting like they were listening. And he just was listening. He just, he literally genuinely was listening when Jeff was talking, both in the audition and throughout the filming. And it was not effortful for him to do that. He, he was only 12, but he was able to be still I mean, we, we would, after he did a few takes, you know, if we were taking a little break, we would get him up and he'd be running around and stuff. And then he'd come back and he could really be as still as he was and a, awake as he was to all the little moments. And Jeff DeMunn, who plays the old man, is one of my favorite actors that has ever existed. Um, I saw him back in like 1976 do a play called Modigliani in New York. Um, and I was so blown away by his performance. I did something I've never done since or before, is I went back and saw the play maybe six or seven times. And I was just stunned by what he was able to do on stage. I've seen him on stage many, many times, and we've worked together on stage. He's got an extraordinary resume. He plays a lot of uh, really unusual, usually supporting roles in film. Um, he's on a show called Billions now that's on television. Uh, he plays Paul Giamatti's father. But he's, he's an actor's actor. He's like, e every actor in New York reveres Jeff DeMond. And I, I asked him if he would do this, and he read it and just fell in love with it and said yes. And then we were able to find a little window of time where he was available. So I, I just got lucky. And James McMenamin, who plays Leo, is a director I've worked, I've directed him in a couple of plays. And, He's a wonderful actor. He, he's a real chameleon. Um, so I just, I got lucky with my actors, that's for sure. Yeah. We have time for one more question, and I think we're going to take the person who's got his finger like this. We're going to get a mic over to him. Well, you, well, you saved the... Save the best for last, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I 
but I do have I do uh, I also admire the, your choices to uh, to like focus the camera in on the characters and try and make it more intimate for the audience. I think it, that deserves a lot of credit. I think you deserve a lot of respect for that. But on to my question, uh, I, I actually have two. But first, first one was uh, uh, for first-time filmmakers. If you have any advice for, like, if you're for given now that you now that you have some time now if you made this film, do you have any advice or any like anecdotal advice that you could carry over to? anybody who is thinking about making a film. And I guess my second question is, now that you've had maybe a year away from this film, do you view it in a different light? Oh, those are both interesting questions. I mean, I think for first time directors, I would say keep it simple. Like, do something that you really care about, that has some meaning for you, and try to keep it fairly, not too many locations, not too many roles, um, because even that is very complicated. So I, I've worked in my life, I'm gonna just guess, I've never counted, but I'm gonna say with 10 or 12 first time directors doing features, some of whom never even did a short film first. How they had the, uh, <laughs> I don't know whether to call it foolishness or courage, to, to dive into a feature film without ever having done a short film uh, is a little incomprehensible to me. And I, I, I often saw that terrible deer in the headlights look, I, I've seen people crying, I've seen people <laughs> just literally almost having nervous breakdowns on the set. Um, but that, that came from taking on something way too complicated as a first time project. So I think that would be my advice to anybody is don't, you know, what is it my grandmother used to say, don't put the cart before the horse. I mean, I think it's, you know, to not, you know, it's great to have big ideas, but I mean, nobody plays Rachmaninoff before they've learned how to play like a little Chopin prelude. I mean, you know, there is a, there is a natural order to things, and not unlike the story in the film, like start with the tree, the rock, the cloud, um, and, and let the, uh, yeah, it's a great metaphor for that. Um, what was your second question? I think the second question was whether with some distance you view the film in a different light from oh. when you first made it. Yes, I mean, it's funny. There was a period of time where we were looking at it all the time. I mean, when you're editing it, you're like looking at it 10 hours a day. And then when you're doing all the sound work and stuff, you're constantly seeing it. And it actually gets to a point where you feel like you don't see it at all. You're just kind of, you're in the technical aspects of it. And then you first see it with an audience and that's like an extraordinary experience. And then, you know, each time is a little differently. Like right now, I haven't seen it for a couple of months and it's like I get to rediscover it all over again in some sort of way. Um, I mean, I, I try sometimes to, um, it's hard to do, but to feel like I'm seeing it for the first time so that I can have that experience of not knowing what's coming next. But it's, it's hard to do when you know, know something so well. But um, yeah, it's, it's, I don't know how to explain it. It's constantly, shifting and changing for me, you know, and I try to get out. I think, you know, as the filmmaker, you also see things that you would possibly change if you could. 
you know, little flaws that only I probably see, or maybe not, maybe, maybe other people are seeing them as well, but I have the illusion I'm the only one seeing them. But things that I would go back and, ch you know, little places where I might shore it up a little, make it a little, move a little quicker, things like that. But you have to let go of that and just let it be what it, what it is. Um, I try to not, you know, bring too critical an eye to it if I can if I cannot do that. Um, and I, I think I I experience it differently with different audiences because audiences respond to different things at uh, uh, you know, a different time when I'll show it. There'll be like, you know, some audiences are very quiet watching it, and some audiences like find certain things funny and, and uh, some audiences are shocked when the man first says, I love you. I've heard people gasp in the, in the theater. They're like, it's an affront. You know, one of the things I love the most about the film is the difference between the first time the man says, I love you to the boy and how the boy v kind of contracts with a certain amount of fear to 20 minutes later, the man says, I love you to the boy again. And the boy is completely able to take it in and allow that to be. And I think that's one of the things about the film that moves me the most, is that in a, in a period of 20 minutes, there can be an exchange between two people that allows for a whole world of feelings to shift and change. Well, Karen, before we segue, I want to thank you again for making an unbelievable first film. Oh, thank it, you. It so really much. is terrific. <laughs> Let's all give her a round of applause. So that leads us to the next portion of the evening. And we came upon a film which, upon reflection, also deals with some of the same themes that we just experienced in your movie, whether it's love, loss, longing, searching. They're all part of Starman. Yeah. Um, which is going to turn 35 years old next year. <laughs> it's incredible. I, I remember <laughs> seeing it as a kid in the movies and subsequently on VHS, and it was on all the time, but it seems to be one of your films that is not as regularly talked about or screened, and so I'm thrilled that we were able to have an opportunity to screen it here tonight. And I was hoping to get some reflections from you about it as we get ready as an audience to see the movie. Um, I guess we made it in 1983, does that sound right? Um, I was a little, they, they offered it to me. <laughs> and, well, first of all, John Carpenter directed this film, and I, I knew of him, but I had never seen those films, The Fog, uh, uh, Halloween, um, It, The Thing. The thing. Um, so, <laughs> I, I thought, oh, I'll do my, my research, and I, you know, I you am a real, I, you know what, I am a, such a wuss uh -huh. in terms of, like, right. those kind of films, and um, I was living alone in New York City, and I think I had all three films, and I put them on, and I got about 15 minutes into each one, and I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> they were just too scary. Um, but I met with him and I really liked him. And I thought, isn't this cool that he's gonna do this film which was seemed to be like going down a whole nother road. I was a little scared of the film. I thought, oh, you know, this is a tricky premise. So a woman wakes up in the middle of the night having recently lost her husband and this being from another world like you know, comes into the DNA of his body. And I thought, mm, you know, like w we deal with as actors, you know, the, the, what we call the, the what if, you know. That's a pretty hard what if <laughs> to embrace. So I was a little, um, 
a little nervous about it. I, I think it took me a while to really read it and reread it and read it and reread it and think, oh, you know, can I, can I do this? You know, can I really bring an authenticity to this role? And I finally said, yes. And they hadn't cast Starman yet. Um, they went, you know, there were a number of people that they discussed with me that they were interested in. And then suddenly John said, Jeff Bridges walked into my office today and gave the most amazing audition for this role. And I said, I love Jeff Bridges. And so he, he was cast. And I have to say, I had, I had one of the most wonderful times working with him of any actor I've ever worked with in the theater and in film. He was the most delightful person very creative, very warm and engaging, and generous of spirit. And, um, you know, we have stayed friends over the years. And um, I just, I think he's absolutely wonderful in this film. He was nominated for an Academy Award. And um, he just, he's a, again, he's like a wonderful, He's done so many different kinds of work in, in the film world. Um, so, you know, it's a road movie, basically. <laughs> We're on the road the entire time. I've never, you know, it, it's a little challenging to act in a car for an entire film. <laughs> You're kind of sitting the whole time. And we get out of the car every now and then, but an awful lot of the film takes place in a car. And sometimes the camera's here, sometimes it's here, and sometimes there's a sound man curled up at your feet, and it looks like you're sitting trying to drive the car, but you know, you can't see out any of the windows because there's equipment all around you, and you have a sound man kind of on the floor <laughs> in front of you, and you trying to tuck up so your feet is in, in, in his face. And um, there's, you know, it's, we, we had a lot of laughs, um, you know, because it, it's so hard, really, to, to work in a car. But, um, you know, it's just a, I, I had a, we had a great time doing it. There was some backstory to the film actually reaching its point of fruition. We were talking about it a little bit before. You mentioned there were many different writers that worked on the movie. And I also read that there were different directors attached to it oh, at different points in time. Yeah. And the other thing that I read about, and this is an interesting context to watch it from, is that I guess it bounced from one studio to another and there was some concern on the part of a studio about a film that was deemed too similar that ultimately wound up being E.T. Right. And that so, yes, the studio they were kind passed on this other of, film yes. that became E.T. Yeah. because they were already hitched at that point to what would be Starman. Yeah. Was any of that... Uh, on, on your minds or at the time of the making of the film or at the point of release, something that was... I don't think was, we were really aware. Was I not, wasn't aware. No. The only way I knew that E.T. was happening was because when I was doing Raiders of the Lost Ark with Steven Spielberg, he was developing E.T., and occasionally I would get to see some drawings or something that had to do with the development of that story. But I think when, when we came to do Starman, I don't really remember if E.T. had come out already or if they, that was happening simultaneously. But I don't think we knew any of that at the time. I didn't. Nobody had ever made me aware that these two films were sort of somehow thought to be in competition with each other. And here we are so many years later, does it surprise you that of all the movies you've been in, this one these days is often talked about, about the possibility that there would either be a reboot, a remake, or a sequel potentially, that there's the, the rumor mill for years has been running rampant, but 
you might be able to speak more to it than I about the possibility of that happening. Well, I love the idea of, I like, I would, I like the idea of there being a sequel and us getting to meet the child, you know, who would be half human and half from another world and for those of you who've never seen the film, I don't want to, spoiler alert, but... We have no <laughs> idea what you're talking about. <laughs> but I'm, I'm left with something at the end of the film which I'm told to give the child when the child is old enough. And there's this sense of it, it will be a highly evolved being. So a lot of people come up to me and say, where's the sequel? I want to meet this highly evolved being. You know, I want this highly evolved being to show up and help us, <laughs> help us in the world. And I think, yeah, like that would be a fantastic, I'd like to see that film. Um, so I don't, I don't know if it will happen or not. Yeah, they talk about sometimes doing a, a remake, which you know, I'm not real big on, on remakes of films, but I, I love a sense of the story continuing, yeah. How long has it been since you last saw this movie in a movie theater on the big screen? It's been a while. Um, I'd really have to think about, I think it was, there was a screening uh, five, okay. seven, ten years ago or something that I, I went to and I saw it on a big screen. Um, it's been a while. Well, we have a beautifully digitally restored version that we're about wait. to see. And so we'd love for you to stay and join you us You guys are so lucky to have this beautiful theater. Oh my God, it's so fantastic. Well, thank you once again for everything and for coming down tonight. And let's all enjoy Starman okay. now. Thank you so much for coming. I was really pleased to have a chance to talk with you.